Hi, I'm Matt Gordon, and this is Getting Started with MicRim OS. Today, we're continuing our discussion of services in MicRim OS that enable task interaction. The particular form of interaction that we're going to consider now is resource sharing. In our last episode, we discussed semaphores, which are kernel objects that you can use to synchronize the tasks in your application. And while synchronization services are highly useful, you'll need more than that to write robust multitasking code. Often, such code involves shared resources. What kind of resources? Variables, data structures, and even peripheral devices that are used by multiple tasks or by a combination of tasks and interrupt handlers. Without any mechanisms to protect them, Shared resources can lead to serious problems. This is true in both kernel-based applications and foreground background systems. Let's imagine a foreground background system incorporating two functions that access an A to D converter, a foreground function or interrupt handler, and a background function. Now, unless it were written to disable interrupts, the background A to D function could easily be interrupted by its counterpart in the foreground. The likely result would be an unexpected combination of A to D register values, along with unexpected behavior from the A to D converter itself. This kind of issue is referred to as a race condition. That's because the resulting behavior is dependent on the relative timing of the pieces of code involved. Unfortunately, race conditions are notoriously difficult to resolve, and they can remain undetected for months or even years following a code release. Race conditions always involve an interrupt handler in a foreground background system. However, in a kernel-based application, interrupt handlers are not the only potential source of the problem. Race conditions are also possible with any combination of two or more tasks. That's because of the preemption mechanism that we discussed in an earlier video. In kernel-based code, the potential exists for a task that is accessing a resource to be preempted by another task that uses the same resource. We'll now see example code featuring two such tasks. The shared resource for this example is a UART. The task shown on the left, named app task UART, contains pseudocode intended to transmit a message over a UART once every second. The right-hand task, app task FS, continuously attempts to read files from a storage device and then outputs the status of those read operations via the same UART. Let's suppose that app task UART is preempted by app task FS. Let's also suppose that the preemption takes place while app task UART is writing the UART registers involved in its periodic message transmission. AppTaskFS would soon begin writing the same UART registers, which would likely result in problems. We would, at least, expect an indecipherable message to be transmitted. As the developer of a MicRim OS-based application, it is your responsibility to identify shared resources like the UART and prevent the problems that they can cause. While you're mostly on your own as far as identification is concerned, the kernel provides a number of services to help you ensure that the use of shared resources doesn't lead to problems. In addition to being lumped under the shared resource moniker, these mechanisms for preventing race conditions are sometimes referred to as mutual exclusion services. This is because they can afford a task mutually exclusive access to its resources. There are four different approaches or techniques for protecting shared resources in MicRim OS. They are disabling and enabling interrupts, locking and unlocking the scheduler, semaphores, and mutexes. I've listed these in order of both increasing overhead and precision. In other words, the first technique can be implemented with just a few lines of code. They can have broad effects on application code that uses it. The last technique involves much more overhead, on the order of hundreds of lines of code. But its effects can mostly be limited to the task sharing the resources that it's intended to protect. Let's start at the top. Disabling and enabling interrupts is definitely a low overhead approach if we consider the line count of the code involved. It also happens to be the same approach that foreground background developers must take in protecting their code shared resources. In a kernel-based application, if interrupts are disabled while a task accesses a shared resource, then the task won't have to compete for access with any interrupt handlers. Since preemption is dependent on interrupts, disabling them also prevents other tasks from taking control of the CPU. This means that disabling interrupts is a viable means of protecting shared resources of all types and it turns out to be the only means of protecting resources that are used by an interrupt handler. The other approaches that we'll discuss are fine for protecting resources shared by tasks, but they aren't effective when an interrupt handler enters the picture. Of course, interrupt disabling is not without its drawbacks. It is something of a sledgehammer technique. 
eliminating interrupts and consequently preemption leaves an application with just a single task. All other tasks and interrupt handlers are prevented from executing until interrupts are re-enabled. The impact on other interrupt handlers can be particularly worrisome since it increases a system's interrupt response time or interrupt latency. That is one of the primary reasons why developers have traditionally been advised to disable interrupts only sparingly or to avoid doing it altogether. In MicRim OS, one of the alternative approaches to protecting shared resources is locking the scheduler. The kernel's API includes schedule lock and unlock functions. These can be used to prevent multitasking while a shared resource is being accessed. In terms of overhead, the use of these functions is somewhat similar to disabling interrupts. Both are relatively lightweight approaches. But locking and unlocking the scheduler offers a slightly higher degree of precision because it doesn't affect interrupts. As a result, it can't be used to protect resources that are accessed by interrupt handlers. But for resources shared strictly among tasks, it can be an appealing solution. The final two solutions I mentioned, semaphores and mutexes, present a significant jump in overhead over the first two. However, there is a commensurate increase in precision with these relatively high overhead approaches. Unlike the other two methods that we've discussed, semaphores and mutexes tend to directly impact only the portions of code that use a shared resource. In our last video, we discussed semaphores as a means of synchronization, or signaling the occurrence of events. So, they might seem to be a strange choice for resource protection. But interestingly enough, semaphores were originally devised for this purpose. And the MicRim OS API functions that we've already discussed support both semaphore roles. Let's look briefly at how this works. For the purpose of resource protection, you would typically initialize a semaphore's counter to 1, rather than the 0 used for event signaling. Two tasks sharing a resource would perform pinned and post operations on the initialized semaphore. Each task would pin prior to accessing the resource and post afterwards. To understand how this setup would provide protection, let's return to the idea of the semaphore as a signaling mechanism. What we're signaling here is simply the availability of a resource. Because we're initializing the semaphore to one in the case of resource protection, the application effectively starts with one event signal. So the first pending task would decrement the counter to zero and quickly return. The task could then access the resource with scheduling and interrupts both continuing to occur. Now let's assume that, as a result of preemption, another task associated with the same shared resource subsequently gains control of the CPU. What happens? The second task would eventually perform a pend on the semaphore, which, as we've already seen, would then have a zero counter. Under the event signaling paradigm, this would indicate a lack of events. So the second task would be placed into a waiting state. The original task would continue to run and would post the semaphore only when it finished using the shared resource. The post would make the second task ready and it could access the resource itself. This approach to resource protection might seem ideal for relatively long stretches of code that access shared resources. It could be disastrous to disable interrupts or even lock the scheduler over such stretches, so semaphores would appear to be a great alternative. However, there's a problem that can occur when the semaphores we've just discussed are used for resource protection. That's why we recommend using these kernel objects for synchronization only. There's actually another type of semaphore, referred to as a mutex, that can more safely be used to achieve resource protection through pend and post calls, and it will serve as the topic of our next video. So, to sum up what we covered today, there are four different techniques for protecting shared resources in a kernel-based application. They are disabling and enabling interrupts, locking and unlocking the scheduler, semaphores, and mutexes. The first two of these techniques impose little overhead and work relatively well for small passages of code. But they can have a negative impact on your application if not used carefully. Semaphores might initially seem to be a helpful alternative, but as we've just seen, they introduce the potential for priority inversion. That leads us to mutexes, which we'll cover in detail in our next episode. See you next time.